Hello again, everybody. Uh, this video is for my grad students in English 5317 at the University of Houston downtown. Coming to you straight out of Westbury, outside of Houston, Texas. Um, so, last time we were talking about uh, Nisha and Sassur. Um, today, I want to talk about Bakhtin. Um, because Bakhtin attunes us and draws our attention to some aspects of communication that we really haven't touched on yet this semester, and they point us in a very different direction than Saussure did. So today we're talking specifically about Bakhtin's On the Problem of Speech Genres, and we're using um, the selection uh, from the Bizell and Herzberg book, The Rhetorical Tradition. So. It would be smart to begin with a consideration of what genre is. What's genre, right? And we've said in class that a commonly accepted definition of genre is that a genre is a formalized response to a recurring situation. A formalized response to a recurring situation, right? Um, and so all that means is that there keeps coming up a particular situation that we use language to respond to and that through the repeated coming up of those situations, we've refined certain rules about how we respond to that event through language. So today is my son's birthday. Um, and a birthday is one of these occasions, right? Um, uh, uh, birthdays come up over and over, right? And we've, uh, we've developed certain um, genres of communication for doing the linguistic work that we use language to do on birthdays. So one example of uh, a speech genre is the birthday card. Right, what the birthday card is a genre that got developed so that now you know you, you send somebody a birthday card and that does some kind of work for you, some rhetorical work, really. Um, there's also you know, you, you also say happy birthday when it's somebody's birthday, even if it's that's just as a formality, all right. Sometimes you've probably said happy birthday to people where you're thinking, God, I hope this person has a miserable birthday, right? But you never say that, you never say have a miserable birthday, right, um, unless, unless you're really mean. Um, but, uh, so that, that statement, that concise statement is one type of um, routinized language usage to a recurring situation. Of course, there's other situations, like, for example, the need for a job, right? So a lot of people find themselves unemployed due to this virus now, and a lot of people are going to be looking for work. And as a society, we've developed certain uh, formalized practices of um, language use that are designed to deal with job seeking, right? The cover letter, the resume, these are um, genres, right, uh, that were developed to respond to that particular situation. Okay, um, so uh, Bakhtin is interested in speech genres genres of speech, but he makes clear that he's not only talking about oral modes of communication. He makes clear he's also talking about written communication under the auspice of speech. Um, so we're talking about basically different genres of communication, how they work. Now, he see, Bakhtin sees others as overly invested in the structure of language that is in grammar or linguistics, right? The rules, if you will, of how a language is put together. He thinks there's been too much emphasis on that, right? Um, Saussure, who we talked about a little bit last week, was a break from that. Saussure was more interested in how does language take on meaning, right? Um, and that was an interesting uh, new direction for us in the course. But Saussure um, is offering a different emphasis than Bakhtin. Bakhtin isn't interested in the structure of the language ex his, itself, and he's not interested in how meaning works. He's much more interested in usage, right? And in particular, he's interested in how language use um, has some socio-cultural ramifications. Um, and in other words, how does language use 
uh, uh, operate um, for communicative purposes, right? And if, if it's worth thinking about, like, what do we mean by communication? To commune with something is to be with it, right? And when we're communicating, who are we being with? The people that we're communicating with, right? And so he's interested in how language structures human relationships and this kind of thing. So let's talk for a minute about how he sees this setup, right? Um, yes, he says that there is this this formal um, formal structure of language, right? Uh, but within that language, right? In, in theory, in the English language, there are infinite numbers of what he would call utterances that could be made, right? There are infinite combinations of signs or words um, that could be used to make meaning. So in other words, um, you know, we can't count how many different claims it's possible to render in English. Um, but he sees a number of different speech genres operating within language. And so there's a speech genre, here's a speech genre, and of course there's others, right? There's really, he says, it, it, early on in our reading, he says, it might seem like there's so many speech genres that it'd be impossible to systematically study them. And he gives some examples of speech genres right on um, the, the first page of our reading. He says, um, let's see, in fact, the category of speech genres should include short rejoinders of daily dialogue, and these are extremely varied depending on the subject matter, situation, and participants. Speech genres include everyday narration, writing in all of its various forms, brief standard military commands, elaborate and detailed orders, the fairly variegated repertoire of business documents, for the most part standardized, and the diverse world of commentary in the broad sense of the word, social, political, and we must include here all diverse forms of scientific statements in all literary genres, from the proverb to the multi-volume novel. It might seem that speech genres are so heterogeneous that they do not have and cannot have a single common level at which they can be studied. Uh, but of course he goes on to, to show that they can. Now, within any particular speech genre, right, he looks and sees utterances, right? So within any possible speech genre, there are a number of possible utterances. And what he means by that is um, a single unit um, of a whole communication. Okay? And we'll get to what we mean by that. But so if, if we think of a particular speech genre as an instruction manual, let's say, um, an instruction manual that might come with a toy or with some new piece of technology, right? We recognize, I got one right here, hold on. This is the instruction manual for my digital 8-track, right, that I record some music on. It's... 74 pages, right? And probably, um, you know, the interesting thing about the instruction manual is that whole swaths of this make no sense to me, right? I'll show you a page. Right? There, there's whole swaths of this book that I, I just don't know what they're talking about. But then the places that I do use, you notice I've made some notes in. Right, like, okay, remember, Adam, do all that stuff right there. Um, and, you know, when I open this thing, I recognize that I've seen other texts like this before, other instruction manuals, right? Now, within the speech genre of the instruction manual, this is an utterance. Here's an utterance, right? It's one unified piece of communication um, that occupies this genre, okay? Um, so now he also says that there are primary and secondary genres, primary and secondary genres. And the primary genre seems to be, um, primary genres are sort of everyday genres of speech. Um, and, and so these include just, you know, chit chat, everyday dialogue, um, you know, non-expert forms of communication, okay? The secondary speech genre 
he points out, tends to be, um, you know, a a uh, particular genre that is designed for technical applications. Okay, um, and so you know, um, instruction manuals are are one example, or um, uh, medical literature is another example that mobilizes some technical knowledge. Scholarly literature, right? Um, so academic writing would be another secondary discourse or secondary genre, I'm sorry. Um, you might beg the question, like, right now I'm participating in a particular genre of speech. What genre of speech is it? Well, it's the, the lecture, right? Um, and perhaps, you know, a subgenre is sort of the online lecture. Right? And I think, you know, we're, we're invited to sort of consider, well, how do questions, traditional rhetorical considerations of things like speaker, things like audience, work within the context of this lecture? Um, you know, uh, and, and as we'll get to in just a moment, I think they work a little bit differently. So we have the primary genres and the secondary speech genres. Um, and within those genres, there are utterances, right? Within the genre of instruction manual, I just showed you a particular utterance, this instruction manual, okay? Um, oh, I thought I turned the page in my notes and I didn't. Okay, so he's particularly, particularly interested in describing this utterance, right? And not a particular utterance, but conceptually. What is an utterance? What does it do? How do we know one when we see one? He talks about style as being intimately related to the utterance. Um, and so let's look at a passage on 1229 because I think it's interesting that the way that this gets connected to ethos. And we talked about this a little bit in the course so far. So this is in the second column on 229. Bakhtin says, first of all, stylistics. Any style is inseparably related to the utterance and to typical forms of utterances, that is, speech genres. Any utterance, oral or written, primary or secondary, and in any sphere of communication is individual and therefore can reflect the individuality of the speaker or writer. That is, the utterance can possess an individual style. But not all genres are equally conducive to reflecting the individuality of the speaker in the language of the utterance. That is, uh, uh, to an individual style. And so, let's talk about for that for just a second. What he's saying is something we talked about in class, and it's really, um, you know, of, of, uh, of relevance to technical communication. Because we talked about how technical communication, at least in most of the genres it works in, doesn't allow for a lot of expression of individual style, right? Think about the instruction manual, right? The person who wrote that instruction manual didn't sit down and say, I want to write a, a manual that expresses my personal aesthetic sensibilities. Instead, they attempted and failed to do a plain writing project, right? Where like it's clear, spiritless prose that simply conveys information, okay? Um, now, other genres do have, uh, allow for the, the, uh, the use of style as a means to uh, bolster an ethos, right? I talked a little bit about class, how in my writing I really do try, sometimes with more success than others, to produce a type of writing that is recognizably my own. Right, that, that somebody who reads a lot of what I've written would say, that sounds like an Adam Elwanger essay, or whatever, right? And, and we could talk about the ways that, that ethos can be achieved through style. Um, but he says that style is inseparably linked with genre. And just because there isn't an individual style that gets expressed through the instruction manual, that doesn't mean that it isn't a stylized piece of communication. It is a highly stylized piece of communication, but what it's doing is observing particular rules of the genre, which in this case demands a, a, a plain language style, okay? All right, um, and genres and utterances don't exist in a vacuum, and so it's important to note that a particular speech genre doesn't just like get born uh, of itself, 
right? Um, so let's talk about the novel, right? The, the, the genre of the novel. The genre of the novel becomes popular when? When do we start seeing novels? Well, you know, the, the, the novel starts becoming a real cultural form in Western Europe in the early 17th century, right? Well, why? Why did, why did all of a sudden was there this new genre, this new type of utterance that was coming up at this moment in this place and time? Well, a couple things. One, right, was the, the emergence of the printing press, which had happened a few centuries prior, right, but that made writing available to people in, in ways that it wasn't before. But perhaps more importantly, we've had stories for a long time, short stories, what is the novel but a really long short story? And some researchers have talked about the ways that sort of um, bourgeois liberalism allowed for the rise of, of the novel. That for the first time in human history, people in Western capital society, capitalistic societies had enough time to sit around and read a 400-page narrative, uh, uh, imaginative um, story, right? Um, and so, you know, also like the, the spread of literacy, the achievement of popular literacy um, in, in Europe also pushed the novel as a popular form, right, as a form that is aimed at regular people, okay, um, as a diversion or a distraction, right, um, as something you do that's not work. And so my point is this, is that like somebody didn't discover the novel one day. There were historical and cultural changes that prepared for the emergence of a form or genre like the novel, okay? And Baptiste talks about this a little bit on page, um, let's see, it's on page 1230 and 1231 where he says, look, you have to understand that every utterance in every genre isn't an island that language, and the, language uses in these places are fundamentally responsive. And what that means is, right, even what appears to be a freestanding statement is actually often a response to perhaps something that was said years ago, perhaps something that was unsaid but implied, right? Um, and so, for example, right, like if somebody had a really bad experience at, at church as a child, right, when they're voicing their thoughts or opinions on religion, right, that experience from 40 years ago, right, might be, might be um, shaping those comments that are made behind the scenes, right? Um, and so in this way, this sort of problematizes agency and the intention of the speaker, right, and the speaker's status as such, right? If you're not so much in control of what you're speaking, but that rather what you say is a product of certain extrinsic experiential or historical phenomena, right, this troubles the traditional um, notion of the rhetor as this um, uh, intentional uh, communicator, okay? All right, so speech genres and utterances are responsive, right? They're always responding to something. Um, and on 1233, Bakhtin says that any utterance is a link in a very complexly organized chain of utterances, okay? And so again, he underscores that idea that no utterance exists in isolation, that every utterance, the utterance I'm making now, even though it seems like I'm the originator of this lecture, right? This is actually a responsive statement to something else that was said to me or to external forces um, that are working on me, okay? Um, and this really links into a key theme, a key contribution of Bakhtin's essay here for rhetoric and its modern term. And that is that Bakhtin sees the audience as a generative force in communication, as a generative force in communication. Now, let's talk about a little bit about what that means, okay? 